Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Uh, today is New Year's Day. I'm going to be putting makeup on, but I'm not going to talk about the makeup, but I will maybe put uh, in the description what products I use just because if I watched a video where someone's putting makeup on, I would be curious and I would want to see what they were doing. This might be kind of a noisy, background noisy video because I'm in Chicago, it's storming outside. Um, it's a snowstorm day and it's very windy and it's, um, well, the answer to some of the noise is very non-glamorous. It's because I live right on an alley and sometimes you'll hear a loud banging noise and that's the sound of the wind blowing the dumpster doors open against a fence. <laughs> It's the new year and people are, a lot of people are thinking about habit change. So I thought what better time to talk about my own experience with significant habit change uh, in the last year, especially, but in general um, over the years. And I wanted to talk about how I quit using weed in the last year in part with the mission of getting a CDL. This is a subject I've I've wanted to talk about for a while and I like talking about recovery related things because I think uh, sort of taking things out of the dark and like demystifying things by just being a face who like being a person out there who's like I have done this thing I have struggled with this thing I have had this experience it helps to sort of just make it more normal because it isn't it doesn't make a person like abnormal to have done something or struggled with something or had addiction like it actually is very normal it's very human and i think it's important to share that message far and wide you know um but specific to cannabis weed marijuana whatever term you like to use which also there's a whole other interesting set of circumstances surrounding the way that we refer to the plant the substance and how that relates to things like racism and, um, you know, marginalizing people who use certain things. And I, that's a whole other subject. So I won't try to get into that because I think that's above my pay grade. But anyway, for the purposes of this video, I will probably say weed more than anything because that's just like the colloquial common way that many of us talk about it. And that's the way I have mainly talked about it. I think it's a, it's a difficult subject in particular to talk about, especially in the recovery space, or like if you're talking about recovery and then you invite discussion of weed into it because it really makes people prickly. It's like, well, weed isn't addictive. Like automatically you, you will have like people arguing about that. And so if, you know, enough people were to watch this video and comment on it, I'm sure there would be some arguments on the, in the comments or arguments against things I say in the comments like, how dare you? People get very upset about that. And uh, I have empathy for those people, um, but I think that's their experience and my experience is different. So I'm just talking about my experience. That said, I think of myself as a pro-weed person, like um, in the sense that I think it has so much value. And I think that if our country wasn't so backwards in the way that we have approached uh, drug control and drug policy, um, we would be able to have this whole different understanding of it as a useful plant. But obviously there are a lot of political and economic reasons why that is not the case. I think any of us who has done any, spent any time researching the subject knows that like the reasons why things are illegal are not based in anything rational. It's based in like some people wanting to be in control over things and control the money and control the people control the population and control populations of different races and economic backgrounds. But so uh, again, not trying to get into a whole political thing, but it, it is kind of hard to talk about weed or other drugs without getting at least a little bit political because those things are very much political. Originally, like the first time I ever had issues with weed was when I was in college. And I was one of these people that didn't smoke it until like way late. I didn't start, well, until I was 17. I started sort of dabbling a little bit, but I was like this super straight laced kid. I was a band geek, which I still am proud of. And I didn't drink. I didn't, I started sort of dabbling with cigarettes also when I was 17. And that was, a lot of that was just a combination of peer pressure and being depressed and not having the type of, um, healthy attention I needed from the adults in my life and guidance. So I was kind of, and also just being a teenager. I mean, let's face it, like you want to experiment, you want to be rebellious, you want to do things that you think are like a little naughty and whatever. And so 
there was that sort of conflagration of factors, which isn't that unusual. Um, when I was younger, I didn't have such a handle on my own sort of tendencies toward addictive behaviors. And I should say, I'm not a person who subscribes to the disease model of addiction. So that kind of is different than a lot of people who are in recovery. And it sort of depends on your own approach to recovery. Um, I don't do 12 step recovery and I don't disparage people who do or disparage that way of doing it. I think whatever works for people is what they should do. You know what I mean? I am in smart recovery, which is a cognitive behavior therapy based approach to recovery where you learn how to change the dialogue within yourself, that you, the way that you talk about yourself and your life and your addiction issues um, in order to work your way through those things and change your behaviors. And it's been super effective for me along with uh, therapy and other things that I consider part of my recovery, like a regular yoga practice and breathing exercises and day-to-day -day subtle changes. That to me is like the big enchilada is like, when it comes to behavior change, especially being an American and being like in a culture that emphasizes extreme changes or extremes in general, um, it can be really difficult to be like, I want to make a change and then just like do, you know, think of, you just want to do it all at once. I want to, you know, I, for me, I've been historically somewhat of a perfectionist, which I think is not very uncommon for people who have uh, addictive personalities or tendencies. Um, where it's like you want to go all the way when you do something you just got to go 100 percent there's no in between and uh, that certainly has been my pattern with all types of things healthier things and and unhealthy things whether it was cigarettes or an alcohol and weed or exercise and dieting and you know my approach has tended to be like there's no middle ground it's like one thing or the other and that's something that has changed with time and practice you know and um it takes a ton of patience to change those things to work on yourself it takes courage and it well just really those things patience courage and time i would say you know and like i partly wanted to make this video in hopes that somebody who's watching it maybe is ha is having a hard time and hearing from somebody who has who identifies with that and who is somewhat on the other side of that I hope that offers some hope and some, you know, like, I believe in you energy. I want to be a, a a source of positive talk um, because there's, we need that. We need that. And, it, and if you're a person who's watching this and you're struggling with some type of addiction, some type of unwanted behavior, um, a substance use issue, I just want you to know you're totally not alone. You're not a bad person because you have a struggle and you can change. And even if you, like I did for a long time, felt like I could not change and I was always going to end up going back to the same stuff, I totally know how that feels and I promise you that change is possible change is possible. I didn't mean to just instantly go into talking about recovery, but it's something I'm really passionate about. I didn't say, by the way, SMART stands is an acronym. It stands for self-management and recovery training, which is redundant because then it's self-management and recovery training recovery. <laughs> so if you're into words, if you're one of those language people, you'll be like, well, that's redundant. But anyway, there are definitely some people that are part of a more 12 step approach that would disagree with the efficacy of something like SMART. One thing that is tends to be different is that while people in SMART, it's not to say people in SMART are never religious because there certainly are, but I think SMART tends to attract more atheist and agnostic people as well because a lot of us don't want to say like I subscribe to a higher power or like I you know, like um, one of the tenets of a 12 step is surrendering to a higher power. And for some people, that's something that they don't feel like it should be an absolute in terms of them being able to recover. Like I want to recover and I don't want to compromise the things that I believe. So that's where there's a place in a more science based approach. But you know what? Again, like I said, whatever gets you there, because for some people doing something like 12 steps, which is I, in my perspective, I think it's a bit, quite a bit more rigid. For some people, they need that. In SMART, 
you know, if someone comes to a meeting, for example, and says they want to do harm reduction and they're still using or they're still drinking or whatever it is, and they're trying to cut down, we don't say, well, you can't come back to a meeting, but you can't do that in a 12 step meeting. You can't be like, well, I'm still drinking. They'd be like, get out of here because you're a bad influence. So, you know, there are different approaches. And if anyone watches this and wants to correct anything I say or share a different perspective, I 100% welcome that because I think it's extremely important in recovery to allow for differences in approach and differences of opinion um, because it's hard. <laughs> it's hard for anyone who does it and it's okay that it's hard. You know, if it was easy, none of us would be there in the first place. You know, you'd be like those jerks are like, I can just have two drinks and go home and I'm fine. Like <laughs> jerks. No, I'm just kidding. So let's get back to talking about weed. So yeah, I wanting to get a CDL was one reason why what was a big source of motivation for me to quit smoking weed. Um, and like I said, I used it when I was in college. It really had a very negative impact on my college years. Oh, it's such a controversial thing to talk about because again, a lot of people bristle. They're like, you know, well, maybe you had a problem with it. And it's like, I just feel the need to keep repeating like, yeah, it didn't work for me. I'm not talking about anybody but myself here. And if you relate to what I'm saying, cool. And if you don't relate to what I'm saying, that's cool too. But for me, when I was in college, what I really needed was some support. I needed some guidance. I needed structure. I did not need to be at a four-year school away from home because I wasn't mature enough to handle the stress of that. And I had just gone through a very traumatic, I, I'm not going to give you the long story, but because of really because of someone else's severe addiction problem, my family was torn in half. And I was forced to move uh, from California to Illinois. And that was really extremely traumatic because it was this enormous culture shock for me, which I've talked about a little bit in other videos. And I'm sure I'll talk about again. I wasn't ready for what I was sort of thrust into. And when I was in college, I, that's when I really started to kind of go crazy with like alcohol and I started smoking like crazy and I started, I was working my way through an eating disorder and that's another aspect of my own addiction pattern or my history of addiction that was like one of the steps for me, eating disorders were a step on the way to um, alcohol abuse and and smoking, cigarette to nicotine abuse, I don't know if that's what you would call it. Smoking is by far, I would say, the hardest thing I have quit. And I'm very proud of that. Um, and it's something I, I like to talk about with others who struggle with it because I have so much empathy. Nicotine is a beast. Um, and for me, one of the reasons I started smoking, aside from like peer pressure and wanting to look cool, <laughs> is that even though it was such a, such a um, contradiction because I was already like really into working out, but I was also obsessed with models and fashion and like I was that was like the late 90s so like the supermodels were such a force in the in our culture and like I was obsessed with Kate Moss and like I wanted to be like those women that were just beautiful and super super skinny completely utterly different body types than mine I love my body type now but back then I could not accept the way I was or whatever and I thought smoking would help me be skinny you know, there's a lot of chicks that probably started smoking for the same terrible reason. And I smoked for four years while I was in college and then I quit for 10 years. And I maybe, you know, smoked one or two cigarettes during that whole 10 year period. Cause I was married, I was, I was with my ex and then we were married. So we were together for that full 10 years and neither one of us smoked. And I think that speaks to something that is really important for a lot of people in recovery is um, sometimes when you have someone else in it with you, that's your partner or say it's a best friend or somebody, but especially if it's a romantic partner, for a lot of people that becomes sort of like a stronghold and it can really help them. And like, I've been single now for, a little over 10 years and um you know obviously I'm not always not dating somebody but generally speaking I've been I've been in serious relationships I've been on my own which has been awesome and really is a huge reason why I've made so much progress in recovery and like getting to know myself and everything but for some people like having that person is sort of their 
boundary. It helps them keep that boundary between themselves and like a bad habit. So when my ex and I got together, we both were casually smoking at the at the bars. You know, that's when you could still smoke in bars in Illinois, which you can't anymore. <laughs> and we just decided, and he was probably more motivated than I was at the time, but I was like into this dude. So I was like, whatever he says, man, I'm in. <laughs> So we both stopped smoking, kind of cold turkey, and it wasn't hard, but we still kept drinking. Um, and what's interesting is like my drinking was always kind of problematic, but when I was with him, I never really let it go too far most of the time, most of the time, but it was a problem at times. And I think that because there were other issues, I don't think either one of us recognized the role of alcohol in my part of like our relationship not working well or whatever. It's too much to tell. I'm sorry, I'm going on tangents. <laughs> we didn't smoke. And then the day that I learned that that relationship was coming to a very sudden end, I, the first thing I did was go buy a pack of smokes down the street. And uh, I feel inclined to say what type of cigarettes I smoked, but I don't wanna like <laughs> be triggering to people who might hear that and be like, mm. I could go for one of those. I still think about those cigarettes and I'm like, yeah, that sounds good, which is crazy. Cause like, that's a weird thing when you quit smoking cigs, you you can have moments where, and I've talked to other smokers, ex-smokers who have a similar experience where you smell it. If you like someone just lit a cigarette and you can smell like, for me, it's the smell of butane mixed with, I smoked menthols for a long time. I didn't only smoke them, but mostly menthols. And I can totally recognize the smell of a menthol mixed with butane on that first lighting that cigarette. And part of why that has like this weird romanticism for me is that I remember my mom has still smokes and always smoked menthols. And when I, was a kid in the car with her to go grocery shopping or whatever it was, usually shopping though, I always think of, she would light a cigarette right when she got in the car and that was the smell. It was a cool, I'm just gonna tell you, it was a cool. <laughs> so the smell of a freshly lit cool mixed with, you know, the butane, you know, it's weird. And that's the thing, that's part of the power of addiction is like the sensory memories that we attach to things. And I'm like 20 minutes into this video and I haven't even talked about weed. But to me, it's totally related, especially cigarettes, because I feel like any type of drug that you smoke or anything you smoke is for me, especially addictive. And it's partly because it hits your bloodstream so fast when you inhale it but it's also the sensation of smoking is to me very satisfying. And I think that's such a common thing for those of us who smoke like with weed. Um, so let's talk about weed, shall we? <laughs> Since that was like the whole point of this video with weed, you know, these days there's a million and one different ways to ingest it, uh, to ingest THC and related cannabinoids. And um, I, uh, I have always preferred smoking flour and like, I hope none of this stuff, I should give a warning, like talking about this stuff can be sort of triggering to people and make them want to use. So if you're someone who's struggling not to, and you don't want to hear that stuff, then you shouldn't watch my video. Cause I'm going to talk about stuff a little specifically starting now. Um, I always prefer smoking flour. I like smoking bongs for years and I always had a bowl and that was what I smoked most recently. And like, a lot of people like things like the oil pens and shatter and dabs and all that crap. I don't like that stuff. I've, um, I tried shatter or I tried, um, dabs a few times and I hated, I, I was not someone who wanted to be glued to a couch or like, to me, when you get some super concentrated type of, of weed ingestion method, <laughs> that was really a rocky sentence. Um, it's almost to me, it's similar to feeling like you're on a hard drug and I have tried enough of those to like sort of have an idea of when you're, you're so disassociated um, that you can't just do an everyday thing. I was more of a functional stoner is how I, the phrase that I used to use in my mind to refer to myself. And that's um, sort of brings up an important point, which is identity. That's something I think about a lot. And when it comes to any type of addiction, one of the reasons why it can be so difficult to make that change is because of the way we attach a behavior and an experience of a behavior to our sense of identity. I think that can't be overstated. Um, identity ties into so many things. And to be honest with you, um, a lot of my use of weed tied into my family and my family's um, preference that I be involved with weed the way other people in my family were. And, um, 
I was always like too straight for people and like too nerdy and I felt like I was on the outside and I wanted to be everyone I wanted to be accepted by everyone and that was partly what led me to giving in and just doing it but it wasn't just them I'm not trying to blame people because like I had a lot of curiosity too and that's another thing like I think when it comes to substance use it's okay to acknowledge that being human and experiencing your senses and having curiosity about how different things feel is natural and I don't think there's any room for judgment where like someone wants to experience an altered state of consciousness whether it's with alcohol or weed or acid or cocaine or whatever it is I think that the judgment of a substance is really arbitrary and um, in our culture we like to judge people and we'll use depersonalizing labels which is something we say in our check-in in smart we don't use depersonalizing labels like alcoholic or addict but also like junkie or cokehead or you know those are really unhelpful terms because they are loaded and they don't explain accurately like this is a person who uses cocaine or a person who uses opioids or a person who uses marijuana it's very different and I think I want to share that idea that if you're a person who is wanting to make behavior change, think about the way you talk about yourself to yourself and your habits and see if you can adjust the words that you use and you'll notice over time, this is sort of that CBT thing, that cognitive behavior therapy and also another thing called rational emotive behavior therapy, which I believe is a branch of CBT. Um, Albert Ellis, if you look up that name, you'll learn more about it because um, I think he was the person that coined the term REBT. Our brains take cues from the words that we use, including the ones in our thoughts. And this was the real game changer idea for me. This is why I'm not putting makeup on right this second. I'm talking about it, just talking about it, because it's so important that I don't want to be distracted talking about it. I can't emphasize to you enough, if you're someone who wants to do something different in your life, listen to yourself start by listening and even journaling you know it's cliche but it's true it's cliche for a reason because it really helps to hear yourself we can program ourselves in all types of ways and i come to you as a person who used to have a really problematic self program and it took a lot of patience and time and support from other people people i'd never met before and there were new friends and people in my family and sometimes it's hard to find that support maybe in your family or your friend group and that's where going to a recovery group can be really useful it's really hard for people who have an addiction problem sometimes to like seek out recovery it took me a good two or three years after i was aware of smart to ever attend a meeting and it was when i was like at my lowest low and i was struggling with constant suicidal ideation and I felt like my life was ending and I felt like I was in such a deep hole that I was never going to get out of it. And I felt like the worst person and I had no worth. And when I think about that now, I'm like, I can't believe I was that low because now I know that those things I was thinking about myself were not coming from a, a healthy place or a rational place. They were totally distorted by the substance that I was continuously ingesting. But you know, when I, one thing I kind of like to say is that addiction lies to you and it sort of has a way of like the substances alter the brain chemistry and then all of a sudden you're thinking stuff and it feels real and it can be really difficult to discern for yourself like that shit's not true that's not true like you're not a bad person you're a person whose brain is being impacted in a negative way and even someone telling you that when you're in the in the thick of it sometimes it's really hard to like internalize it and that's why I think for a lot of people who know the struggle like I do, going to meetings uh, is a really, really important step because um, it doesn't mean that you're someone different once you start going. It means that you can be who you are and be vulnerable and honest about it and other people are gonna wrap their arms around you proverbially um, or figuratively, I should say. They're gonna wrap their arms around you. They're gonna, they're gonna share the, the type of uh, struggle that you have and it's going to help it make more sense for you so you can start to work your way out of it gradually and it takes time and patience. Did I say that yet? <laughs> anyway, 
this turned into a whole other video that I thought I was going to be talking about weeds, so I think I'm just going to give it a completely different title than I originally was intending to. So let me talk about weed in a more current context, because before I talked a little bit about um, my experience with it in college, and when I first quit, I no, I started smoking again when my marriage ended, and I smoked for four years after that. Um, and when I finally got the courage, it, oh, and I should say, I was in recovery after two years, about two years after my divorce, I, I started in recovery, kind of went back and forth. Like at first, I, when I first started, I quit everything all at once. I quit smoking, I quit weed and I quit alcohol. And it was because alcohol was so, my addiction to alcohol had become so terrifying to me that I thought I'll do anything to stop drinking. And I'm afraid that if I keep doing these other two things that it's going to make it hard for me to not fall back and keep drinking. So I stopped everything all at once. And it was kind of, it sounds weird to say, but for me, um, making the decision was the hardest part, but actually quitting was the easy part because I was in so much pain, physical and emotional pain, that I was so relieved to stop those things and I felt so much better so so quickly um, that it was, it was a giant relief. In my group, we've all kind of, a bunch of us have talked about how for some reason, I know this isn't like universal, but just in my particular group, it seems like people tend to have a hard time around the same four month mark. I don't know if anyone watching this would relate to that. Um, but that was the first time about four months in that I lapsed with alcohol. And then I can't remember if I had started sort of dabbling with cigs again. I was, I was, uh, living with a roommate, um, that was a heavy, heavy smoker. And that was weird because like for a little bit, it was like, ew, I don't want to be doing it like that. And then it just sort of got in my head that I wanted to smoke. One of the things that you can't can't sort of discount is like the influence of people around you and like relationships and stuff. And I was super lonely at the time and I had a mad crush on this roommate. <laughs> and that was part of why I started drinking and smoking again because like I was just trying to connect. I don't know if connect, I don't know what it was. Anyway, it was really stupid. It was a really bad idea. Well, you should never get involved with your roommates either. That part of it was really stupid. But anyway, you live and you learn, right? I had started smoking again, and then I smoked for like, you know, sort of on and off. Like I would quit for, a, I don't even know if I would quit for any duration, you know? But it could be like I was smoking like three cigarettes a day. But then on a bad week, I was smoking closer to 10 or 15 cigarettes in a day. And then I was like, oh my God, I'm like, this is really bad. And one thing I didn't mention is with cigarettes, I had, I started to develop what felt like chronic respiratory illnesses and it was more and more severe over time. And I would get really bad cases of bronchitis and sinus infections that would come together. And it was scary. It was getting really, really scary. And it was like, it wouldn't matter if I only smoked a little bit or if I smoked a lot, it, it would just keep, coming back, it would take longer to go away. And by the time I finally made the, de the decision to quit smoking, I had been, I was sick an average of like two to three months out of the year. And it was like, am I gonna keep doing this and end up with emphysema? Like, what What am I doing? So I was, I was scared enough to be like, this is stupid. Like, this is not working. And uh, I don't know what, how I'm making these excuses to keep smoking, but nicotine, like I said, it's a beast. It's insanely addictive. And when your brain wants a substance, the excuses it will make for you are amazing. Like <laughs> when I quit smoking cigarettes in 2016, I told myself, you know what? As long as you don't smoke cigarettes, you can smoke as much weed as you want. You're not drinking, you're not smoking cigs, just smoke weed, it's fine. So I sort of took like a harm reduction approach to it. And it was dumb because I didn't even have the money to be smoking weed like that. I had no really good excuses to, but I also looking back on it, I don't regret it. I don't feel like bad about it because at the time I needed a way to, to, um, I don't know. I, this is a weird thing to say for someone in recovery because a lot of people would be like, how are you in recovery? And you're talking about it like that. But like I said, I think recovery is really individual and like different people approach it in different ways. And for me, it was like, I was in a really painful place in my life and I needed something to sort of take the edge off of the pain and make me feel more lighthearted and and sort of um, 
let me be in touch with my my deeper introspective side, I guess. Or at least that's the way I explained it to myself back then. I'm not saying it was the best thing to do, but it was better than it had been because at least I wasn't drinking and smoking cigarettes. So that kind of started a pattern and a period of time where I was smoking every day. And I smoked weed every day for after that for like, or not every day continuously forever, but you know, there were periods where I would try to stop um, but I would smoke most days for, I don't know, like six years after that or something like that. I guess that's how, about how long it was. And, um, a couple of times I tried to quit cold turkey. I always go back and forth about whether I want to be specific about how much I was smoking because I, I think that's not totally relevant because I think it depends on the person, like it's relative to the person, but I will say that I was smoking a pretty small amount of very potent um probably like you know I would say I probably averaged like around a 14 percent THC flower um and I would smoke a very small amount of that like maybe three to five times a day or something like that and what I would do is smoke a, you know I'd smoke a little bit in the morning and I'd be functional like doing regular stuff and then I would smoke a little bit in the afternoon, early evening, still being functional. And then I would smoke a, the most at night when I was sort of chilling, watching Netflix, whatever, like a lot of people just being stoned and eating snacks and not an unusual pattern, I'm sure. And, but the thing is like for me, and again, just speaking for myself, um, it was a really unhelpful habit for a variety of reasons. Like I wish I was one of those people that would be like a casual, I'll just smoke once in a while and not smoke all the time, but I already know how I am and I know I love to smoke. And I think saying that is empowering because it's like you hear yourself say, I know that I am going to want to do something like that more because I enjoy it. And it's okay to admit that if it's the truth, you know? Um, but also like everyone who has that experience and likes being high, it's like, you like being high, like just admit it and don't feel bad about it. <laughs> you know, like, it's okay to say that you like that feeling, you enjoy that sensation because uh, having your dopamine instantly higher is something that feels good for anyone. So it doesn't make anyone different to acknowledge that and just be real about it. The thing is for me though, um, using THC like that every day, using weed every day, one of the negatives for me, and I, I've always been a person when I'm struggling with something, I'll, I'll read about it and, and help myself understand what I'm what's going on. And I, um, I know now, and I knew then a lot of the time that I was experiencing something called dopamine syndrome, which is when your dopamine system is sort of hijacked because you're constantly using a, a substance to artificially elevate your dopamine levels. And then what will happen over time is your dopamine system doesn't work well without you using the substance because your brain is just so amazing at adapting to whatever you do with it. So you'll end up having all these issues like you won't have good sleep and you won't have an appetite and you will be depressed when you don't have it. And, and um, there's more things than that, but it also dopamine is a, is a neurochemical that has a lot to do with motivation. So that's why people who smoke weed all the time tend to have very low motivation. because of that that effect on on dopamine levels and like they're constantly being like stoked and then and then collapsing again and it's like that it becomes this sort of yo-yo effect um it's funny because i have similar yo-yo experiences with caffeine but it's i don't know that it's a, a dopamine thing the way it is with weed i would really struggle with moods that was a big thing when i was using all the time i had a, a low mood most of the time even when i was high i would be not in a very good mood um and I, because I smoked the most at night, one thing I learned in, in the reading that I did is the effect of weed on sleep patterns. So there's two types of sleep, as I understand it, that are affected negatively by ingesting weed. One is um, it's called slow wave sleep. And that's the part of sleep where you commit. So I hope I'm getting this correct. I believe I am. 
it's the part of your sleep cycle where you commit things that you learn during the day to memory. So that is part of the reason why you struggle with memory, aside from like the effect on short-term memory when you're actively high during the day. Um, and then the other part of sleep that's affected, which many people probably know if they are regular users, is your um, REM sleep, your REM sleep when you dream. Um, and for years I didn't dream or like I were, if I did dream at all, I never remembered my dreams. And it's funny because now I dream every night. And that came back pretty quickly. But one of the things that I want to share that happened with me, the times that I tried to quit cold turkey that did not work for me and led to me totally just saying, fuck this, I can't do this. And like also made it really hard for me to get myself to try to quit again in the future. I know I'm not the only one who has this experience. When I quit like cold turkey, I had horrible sleep problems, especially severe anxiety dreams where, and I call them anxiety dreams rather than nightmares for a reason because it was crazy. Like the one time that really stands out, I tried to quit, I quit for like two and a half weeks and I just went cold turkey from being like a fairly, the same, I was using the same amount always. I was pretty consistent. I didn't try to like wean myself down. I just stopped. And within, I would say about a week, I was having this recurring dream and it was the apocalypse. It's always an apocalyptic, the world is ending. It's extremely vivid. And like, what's weird is I always think about it because it was like, there was this beauty in it and the imagery that I saw in my dream because it was like dark and these dark blues and dark browns and like, but <laughs> I don't know why I say that because it was like this terrifying doom feeling. And it's like, I'm in this shack that's on the beach and it's, it's filling up with water. And of course you can't see anything. And there's someone on the other side of the wall that you have to save and you can't get to them because you can't see and you're crawling on your knees and everything's dark. And you know that this like demon is coming out of the sea. Side note, this totally makes me think of the song, The Thing That Should Not Be by Metallica. That's <laughs> such a random reference. Oh my God. Anyway, there's like either a monster that's gonna come out of the sea or like a tidal wave, a uh, tsunami that is about to crash over you and take you away. And like, it's funny talking about the dream now because it sounds so silly, but when I was having this dream, it was so exhausting because I would feel like every time I went to sleep, I'd go back into this dream for like the whole night for hours. And it happened for several days where I felt like I wasn't sleeping and I said, fuck this. And I started smoking again. And that experience was so hard for me that it messed with me for years and like other times that I tried to stop to having bad dreams and having like poor sleep and stuff. But it was more than that. It was just whatever narrative I told myself that made me feel like this is overwhelming and I can't do it. I just couldn't get myself to stop. And I journaled, I have years worth of journals where I was saying, I, I know this is bad, I wish I could stop, but I, I just keep doing it anyway. I'm not really happy doing it, but I keep doing it. And you know, that's kind of the hallmark of an addiction, a behavior that you keep doing that you don't really get any joy out of at a certain point, but you just keep doing it because the fear of changing it is bigger than the discomfort that you're experiencing. And this is where, when people try to say that weed addiction is not a real thing, this is where I'm like, okay, but hear me out. <laughs> The thing that is different to me about uh, weed is I think of it as like, I'm trying to think of the, the terminology that I used to use when I was in meetings talking about it. And that, that was one of the nice things about being in SMART is, you know, I could, I could always talk about it. And I did for, for a while, I didn't talk about it because I was just like, oh, this is fine. This is harm reduction. I'm doing this and I'll make a change when and if I decide to, I'll talk about it when and if I decide to. I ultimately, started to talk about it regularly because it bothered me that I wasn't sharing that honestly with my group. But it's like a weird, I always say it's like a weird purgatory thing. It's like, you're not happy. You're not necessarily depressed. Although I think that a lot of um, the way I felt when I was using every day was similar to how I would feel when I was depressed. It's just not interested in life. Um, I found myself having very, like other than having the munchies, don't care about food at all. Don't even care about sex at a certain point. Like don't have any desire to connect with anyone. You really don't want to connect with anyone. So if like someone is trying to, um, be like, Hey, let's hang out. You're like, Oh fuck. I don't want to do that. You know, like I don't want to hang out with anybody. I don't want to 
talk to even talk to my mom on the phone like I really don't want to talk to my mom on the phone even though I enjoy talking with her but it just feels like too much effort I just want to be left the hell alone I want to take my hot baths which is something I did every day I still do that like every day but then it was like that's actually another interesting thing about dopamine syndrome people who have dopamine syndrome will crave hot baths and hot showers and I know that was um, an aspect of that for me, for sure. I'm not explaining the dopamine syndrome thing in enough detail, and I'm not a scientist or a physician, so I encourage anybody who's interested in that or thinks that they might be struggling with that to look it up because I think it's really helpful to understand the physiology of your experience, and that can help you decide whether to make a change or just help you understand what you're going through better, you know? Like when you sort of take away the, oh, I'm a stoner and like, or I'm a loser or whatever negative words you want to use on yourself. If you could just step back and be like, I am experiencing the symptoms of dopamine syndrome. Like <laughs> it's a really different way of looking at it that I find personally, I have found empowering even during the periods of time when I didn't, I w didn't feel ready to change the behavior. Just still having that in my mind of like, this is what I'm experiencing. This is why my mood is low. This is why I don't feel motivated and et cetera. So all of this went on for years. And then finally, I had been thinking about getting a CDL for a really long time. I was working for the delivery service. I kind of realized that I was really languishing in that job, in the real sense of that word. I was just sort of marking time. I was just kind of doing the same thing day after day. And I was physically getting hurt on the job. And like most people there get, get hurt at some point. And I was not making enough money. I was working for people that didn't respect me um, and dealing with customers that, that were constantly, you know, being weird because of my gender and all kinds of stupid stuff. Um, and then, you know what really helped push me over the, over the, the um, hump is a good friend I worked with there. This guy was awesome. Um, we're still in touch. I love him so much. He's such a good dude. And the coolest thing, this is one of the awesome things I've learned in my job my crazy meandering job history is that age is really is a number and when you meet the right people they can be any age and be a positive influence in your life and this guy was 21 when we he was 20 when we started working together he was so he is so smart and shockingly wise for his age and he is a an artist and he had been smoking a lot he talked talked with me about it and we, we always talked about that habit, you know, but we didn't smoke on the job or anything like that, but we talked about it. And then at one point he told me that he quit and he was like, oh, it's awesome. I'm, I'm getting so much more done and da, da, da. And I was so glad he told me that. And that helped push me. And I had told him that I wanted to go get a CDL and he was super encouraging about it. He was like, you can do anything, da, da, da. So we bonded really well. It's almost like he was like a little brother, you know, and he was awesome at the job and that it was fun working together. It was really fun. He helped motivate me to finally just go for it. And what I did first that was really hard, the hardest thing for me, oh my God, so hard, was I knew I wasn't going to go cold turkey because of the experience I had before. But it is very hard, I think, especially because of the demotivating nature of the specific substance that weed is. Um, it's very hard to wean because you have to motivate yourself to use less. And if you're, you know, for a lot of people, like using a little bit doesn't work. It's like either use, it's a like all or nothing kind of deal. Um, but I, what I did was I stopped using during the day. So I limited my use to nighttime and I would have to like make myself wait and only use a tiny bit each time instead of getting super baked like I used to, I would just smoke a little bit. And I did that successfully for about a month and then I quit. And I did that leading into a trip to visit family in California to meet my new nephew. And I knew I didn't wanna be using when I was out in California because while well, I had been using in the past and even with family members who at the time were using, the family member I'm thinking of no longer was using. And I was like, why would I wanna be high when I'm like the only person who would be doing it, you know, with my, my new nephew and like, no, that would be stupid. So I made the decision to, to do that uh, weaning uh, leading into that trip about, a, I started about a month ahead of it. And then by the time I got there, I knew I could just not use any and I wouldn't be in a state of withdrawal. But like many people, being around my family can be very challenging for me. So I brought this joint with me. <laughs> it was one of those ones that's in like the little plastic case, you know. 
and it was like my emergency joint, like in case of emergency break glass kind of idea. And I had it with me the whole time. And at one point I got into a fight with my, my family member and I was like all mad and I had it in my pocket and I was thinking about it, but I was like, you don't want to do that though. Like, what is that going to solve for you? Is it going to make this, this frustration go away? Like, yeah, you'll feel better temporarily, but then you're just going to go back to being feeling pissed off. So I didn't use it. And uh, I ended up still having that thing. It's still in my house. <laughs> and that's a weird thing. Like, even though I quit smoking and I haven't fully gotten rid of all the stuff, but it's not because I intend to use it. I don't even know. It's because you have these weird emotional attachments to like a bowl that you bought at a certain point. And you're like, well, I'll use it someday, maybe. But I don't intend to anytime soon because... I just got my CDL. I'm feeling so much better since I stopped and I did not get into anything anywhere near enough depth in this video what I really wanted to say about about weed and the way it has made me feel and the way quitting has made me feel. But I'm just in such a better place now since I stopped and one of the major differences is my memory. And I know that sounds like a no brainer, like, well, duh. But I think that when you're a person who's using it all the time, you sort of start to almost believe that you just have a bad memory. You start to like internalize that as a belief and you, you have a way of like detaching it from the experience of what you're doing to your memory on a regular basis. You're like, oh, it's not that, I'm just an idiot. I just have a bad memory or something, you know? That's not true, like, my memory isn't perfect, but it's a million times better than it was before. And because I quit, I was able to retain information when I was in CDL school and in the past, retaining information when I was smoking regularly. It was so depressing and that would, that would feed into me feeling bad about myself. Like, I can't fucking string two thoughts together and it's a really frustrating, annoying way to feel. And I don't have that anymore because now I actually can remember things from one minute to the next and like I feel smart and capable and like because I am. I've never not been that. I was just, um, for lack of a better word, I was handicapping myself. My moods are light years better. I'm happy most of the time. I'm in a better mood. Um, I do feel like doing things, although I'm still kind of lazy and I still like being by myself and I think that's fine. I think that's just part of my personality. I think that has a lot to do with me growing up being uh, a little bit of an outsider. Uh, I was picked on a lot. I was a nerd. I like to read books and I got picked on for that and I was a band geek and I always felt like I was, I learned how to be my own friend and now I'm like, I like being my own friend and I like being by myself and that's totally cool and it can be draining to be with other people and I think that's also just part of being a highly sensitive person which is what I am and that's okay. So all these, all these things you're hearing me say, uh, it's like you're hearing me express the fact that I know myself in ways that I didn't in the past. And not only do I know myself, but I like myself, I even love myself, and I embrace the things about me that are that I like and the things about me that maybe I don't like as much, that I wish were different, but it's like I accept myself in a way that I wasn't really able to in the past. Having myself, my consciousness, not be altered by a substance on a regular basis is a really big reason why I've been able to find that sense of self-acceptance because I'm actually in tune with what's really going on. It's not something that is an altered state where I'm not sure if it's an altered state and I'm like, this is just how I am. I'm this, I'm that. And it's a confusion feeling. Instead, it's like, this is my authentic self. I know this is my authentic self and this is what's up, you know? All right, I finished my makeup off camera and there's just a few more things that I wanted to say. Um, this is a subject I could just talk about kind of endlessly and um, hopefully I didn't ramble too much in this video and actually explain things that I really wanted to say. I went into this initially wanting to just talk about I quit smoking weed so I could get my CDL and sort of like center on that, but I feel like there's so much context with having been a person in recovery for a long period of time that I feel like I can't just launch into that because there's more that is backstory that is useful for people to hear. But that said, I definitely intend to keep talking about recovery in, in various videos and do recovery themed videos because it's such an important subject and I love talking about it and I love the idea of normalizing it because those of us who have struggled with substance abuse or behavioral addictions are not bad people or weak people. We are just people. And uh, part of being a people is having 
weird stuff that you have to go through that's hard <laughs> and it doesn't mean you're bad it, it's there's no need to place judgment or put involve um, shame or guilt when you're trying to make your life better those things actually can really stand in your way they did for me so I'm here to tell you that um, there's another way and I'm happy to talk about that and I'm really hoping that people will see this video comment on it maybe share things of their own experience or ask questions um, I would love to answer any questions that anyone might have I'm friends with someone who is a YouTube trucker who strongly discouraged me from talking about uh, my addiction well from talking about weed specifically um, and they said you know people there are people out there who will send that video to your boss to try to get you fired. And my response to that is if someone watches this video and, and wants to send my boss a video of me talking about how empowered I am and how glad I am that I made the choice to make a significant lifestyle change so I could take on a new career that was a little scary, but you know, and who is confident and has a good strong sense of self-worth and wants to help other people feel that way too. Like if someone wants to send that to my boss, then go for it. Because <laughs> it'll probably make my boss more glad that they hired me, is what I think. I, you know, I think it's really important. One of the things that I wanted to, to emphasize that is a really intimidating thing for a lot of people when they even consider recovery, if they can even get past the scariness of that word, which it is scary for a lot of people, because again, it's that sense of identity, like, oh, I don't want to be one of those people. Like, I don't want to be one of those AA weirdos. Well, people in AA aren't weird. They're just people with addiction issues that decided to do the 12-step route, you know? <laughs> Being a person who acknowledges that you have had a problem, um, it, it makes you a strong person. It makes you a cool person. And to tell you what, I've met some of the coolest people and some of my closest friends are people I've met in recovery because when someone can be that vulnerable and open, um, they're just a great person to be friends with, you know? If you're a person watching this and you're thinking about asking someone to help you, um, I just wanna help empower you to make that choice. And if it, my assessment from my own experience with myself is that if you're thinking about it, then it's probably a good idea. And if you go try it out and decide it's not for you, then that's cool. You know, at least you'll have an idea. Um, and also what I want to say, this is extremely important because I have come into contact with people who led meetings that were people who should not have been in that position. I have been to meetings that I wish were different. So that said, if you ever go to a meeting, if you get the courage to go to a meeting and there's something about that meeting that, that really sucks to you, doesn't, you know, jive with you, rubs you the wrong way. If someone says something to you that is insulting and appropriate, especially the facilitator of the meeting, um, don't give up and don't assume that that's how all meetings are going to be. Because just like anything, like there's good teachers and not so good teachers, and there are good facilitators and not so good facilitators. And sometimes you come into contact with other participants in meetings who um, might say some off color things, you know, you come into contact with a wide variety of people in those settings. So try your best to don't to not be deterred because I guarantee that there is a meeting out there for you. Um, I'm really fortunate. I've been part of a really incredible group for a really long time. I've been attending meetings almost every week for, uh, this year we'll make seven, wait, Will this be eight years? Oh my gosh. I started in 2014. Yeah, <laughs> 2022 in October will be eight years. And when I'm on the road, one thing that's been really good about the pandemic is we had to move our meetings to Zoom. So I will be doing Zoom meetings for sure when I'm uh, driving. I just want to say about the idea of identity. If you're watching this and you're like, I am struggling with something, but I don't want to be one of those recovery people because then I can't be me anymore. I want to just encourage you to try to set aside those fears and know that you are still always going to be you and you don't suddenly become someone different because you go to a group and ask for help. You just become a cooler version of who you already are and hopefully a happier and healthier version of who you are and you deserve to feel well and you deserve to not feel trapped or imprisoned or beholden to something that is not serving you. You deserve better than that. You can do better than that and um, don't give up. And if you if you have tried and you have faltered, don't give up because most of the people who do recovery, 
it's, I always say this like anything in life, it's and that's something I used to say when I was a trainer to my clients about fitness, like it's not a perfect trajectory, it never is and that's okay. So if you fall off, you get back on. But there's a thing that I think this comes from 12 steps um, and we still say it in our group, it's like if you are driving from, whoever heard me say just that phrase and is in recovery is like, oh, she's gonna say that one. <laughs> if you're driving from LA to New York and you get a flat tire in Colorado, would you even drive through Colorado? I don't know, but let's say you do. You don't drive all the way back to LA after you fix your flat and start again, right? So you've already made it part of the way. And that's the thing with recovery. It's like, if you've been sober for a while and then you fell off and you feel like, oh, I can't do this. I'm gonna just keep failing myself. Just do your best to let go of that because so many of us, myself included, some of my greatest friends have had those moments. And um, those are the, the tests. Those are the moments that teach you what you're really made of because you get back up and the getting back up is the strengthening part. That's you proving to yourself that you can do it. Um, and no matter how many times it takes, you can do it. So if you want to learn more about Smart Recovery, you can go to smartrecovery.org, um, find a list of meetings in your area. Um, and I encourage anybody who is watching this to please comment and like and subscribe. Um, I will definitely, like I said, talk about recovery more in the future. And I definitely would like to talk more specifically about weed and weed addiction. Um, even though that phrase itself is a phrase that can get people really riled up. But I think these days with more and more states being legal and more people having the experience of using it more reg regularly because it's readily available, you know, people's experience with it is different. It varies and some people love it and think it's the best thing that ever happened to them and they don't have an issue with it. And then there's people like me who realize like, you know, it's, uh, I'm not saying I'm never gonna smoke weed again. I am certain that I will. I don't think weed is terrible. I, I don't hate it. Um, but I think that there is a time, there will be a time in my life when it'll be something that is an option and it's not now because I'm focused on something totally different and I'm very content not using it. And that's fine. That's me. That's where I'm at. That's fine. You do you, I do me. That's what it's all about. So Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. And uh, I will catch you on the next one.